Ireland more than any other is an economy in transition. And we have to move from an economy that, as you all know, was built up to a, a level which was unsustainable on the back of property construction and debt. And that simply was never a sustainable model. And we have to move back to the sort of model that can sustain a small open economy. And it has to be one built on exporting, on innovation and enterprise. That's a difficult transition. Uh, and it, we, are un we understand the difficulty that people are experiencing as we make that transition, but it's a transition that we are successfully making. Uh, and that has been behind the themes that we've selected for our presidency, the themes of stability, growth, and jobs. Uh, it, it's absolutely key that we facilitate, and the EU creates an environment that facilitates the sort of transition that's happening in Ireland, which unfortunately is happening also in many other European states. So we're not alone in having to undertake a, a difficult transition to become more competitive, to become more outward <laughs> focused, to, to, to climb up the competitiveness scales, uh, to assert our capacity to win new markets. That's the challenge that we, and, and uh, that's commonly faced right across Europe. And I think it's important to, although the stability area obviously is not in, in my direct field of endeavour, I think it's, it's important. We've, it's been common, I suppose, in, in, to criticise the EU as being too slow to respond uh, and develop the policy instruments to, to respond to the crisis that has uh, afflicted the Eurozone. Uh, but I think it's only fair to reflect on how far the EU as an institution has travelled in the past uh, 24 months. You know, we've had the, the, the various ESM, the mechanisms to deal with the crisis. We've had the fiscal coordination that had resulted in a treaty put, being put in place and which our people voted in. We've had the decisions by the ECB to intervene in secondary bond markets. We've had, you know, the decision of the European Council to separate sovereign debt and its impact on economies from uh, banking debt and, and the implication very clear for, for Ireland of the advantages of that. We've had the initiation of you know, central bank supervision. We're moving towards you know, bank resolution. Uh, and you know, yes, there's a long way to go, and our presidency will seek to drive on that implementation. But you know, I think that's, it has been an important dimension of progress. And I suppose when you look at the bond spreads, which I suppose gives you a measure of how far we've come, they are truly dramatic, the changes. Uh, for Spain and Italy and Ireland, all are now around the 5% or, or below in respect of 10-year borrowing. You, we have spent the last 30 months, you may say, those countries closer to 10% than 5 uh, clearly in areas that on any measure of evaluation of debt sustainability were unsustainable. Uh, so you, this is a, a very significant body of progress and obviously it's been reinforced uh, last week with the decision in respect of Ireland's, our, Ireland's uh, debt, debt deal on the promissory notes. I think also though you, you have to say that the emphasis on fiscal consolidation, on banking resolution, it has been a narrow focus. And I think one of the criticisms that has rightly been taken up by EU leaders is the need to move beyond that. Uh, President Van Rompuy will be consulting with all of the EU councils on new, new ideas like the social dimension that we need to have and the, the, the debate that's currently very strong on, on the area of, of initiative for a youth guarantee. Also on the broader future, do we need to move towards uh, you know, arrangements where there's both contractual and solidarity instruments to spur reform within the, the, the countries, the member states that need to, to make reforms that are you know, decisively strengthening the capacity of, of the union to withstand the so-called asymmetrical shocks that, that, uh, that, that afflict countries within a monetary union. I think that, that, is, that is, 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 is welcome. Uh, but also I think what's really important is that at a time when government's budgets are constrained, we have to look at what is a credible growth strategy for, for, the, for the union. And I just pick out, in my few words here, uh, four areas where I think we have a toolbox uh, at our disposal that can drive significant growth opportunities in the future. And across the four of them, according to you know, the European Union's own estimates, there's well over 10% of GDP 
capacity, added capacity of over 10% of GDP to be derived from exploiting the opportunities in, in the four areas that I'm going to, 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 to try to deal with. Those four areas are, first one being trade, well known uh, for its opportunities, first degree, uh, first class in, in economics, I think would be the benefits of trade, the mutual benefits of trade. The second one is market barriers. The third one is seeking a, to, to take a lead in transformative technologies. And the fourth is releasing the creativity of enterprise and particularly SMEs, as they call the small and medium and startup enterprise. I think those are four areas that offer real opportunity for growth at a time when you know, there are budget constraints. And there, obviously, there's debate, lively debate, about the balance between consolidation and, 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 and uh, so on. But I think we need to look at the microeconomics, if you like, of these four areas, where there's really real opportunities. Uh, trade, just to deal with trade first. I mean, it, it's the commonly uh, calculated or estimated that 90% of the growth in trade in the coming years will be outside of the European Union. So, you know, we need to forge new relationships uh, and new free trade agreements uh, to open up opportunities to, to grow for European companies, European countries to grow and exploit opportunities in, in emerging markets. The Commission has estimated that the benefit of various trade agreements that are, are available to you know, and have been targeted, represents about 2% of, of GDP and would represent about 2 million extra people at work if we, we exploit them. In terms of that, uh, the impact on GDP and employment, about almost 80% of the, their uh, projected opportunities in the free trade agreements would come from, from three, three areas, the USA, Japan and, and Canada. They're very significant uh, opportunities exist there. You know, if you use export numbers, the Commission estimates that a free trade agreement with the USA could add 30 billion to EU exports, with Japan 25 billion to EU exports, with Canada 15 billion to, to, to exports. I suppose the most significant of those in, in size, of course, is the US, the one area where you know, up until now, was there was no uh, real uh, progress in respect of, of, of trade negotiations. The other two, Japan already, uh, a mandate has been given by the, 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 to, to the Commission to negotiate. There, the potential is for a 35% growth in, in exports to, to Japan, a very significant opening up of, of, of that market. Uh, those, those negotiations are, are now, now starting. Canada, we're close to, to the end of those uh, agreements, and hopefully we can see an agreement. In its case, you're talking about a 13% a growth in the EU trade to, to, to that country. But I suppose the good news uh, that, that came last night is in respect of uh, the, the, the US. Uh, and now we've had in the past week a clear endorsement by the President of the United States as well as the European Council uh, that we, you, it, the, the green light has been given to negotiate a broad-based ambitious uh, trade agreement. Uh, and I think this is, is really exciting opportunity and one that we in the Irish presidency will be determined to do everything possible to facilitate it. Um, as I say, it's, its impact on uh, exports is estimated to be uh, 30 billion on the EU, EU economy. Its impact on GDP is, 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 is much higher, 30, 65 billion in terms of the static uh, economic analysis impact on GDP, but adding in the productivity effects, you can add another 66% to that. So it is a really significant opportunity to, to open up uh, uh, trade and and to facilitate change and as you will see from the high level uh, group they, they focus not only on the ambition to end uh, conventional tariff barriers uh, but also to look beneath that at the non-tariff barriers to look at you know access to markets like public procurement to look at how we can have better 
uh, coordination of regulations across the Union, how we can have more confidence in mutual recognition of compliance and regulatory requirements. You know, these changes are, can be very significant. It also looks to, the Euro to Europe and the US having shared positions in areas where, where they can collaborate. So I think it's a very exciting, uh, the high level group is a very exciting agenda for negotiation and discussion. And I know a lot of work has gone into this by, by, by Commissioner de Gucht as well as by the US side. Uh, and we're having an informal in April, an informal council. I think it's the first trade informal. And it's been very precisely targeted on this specific opportunity. You know, we've seen in the past that it has taken a long time to move from, you know, opening up the principle of, of having a trade agreement, say, with Japan to get a mandate finalised. That took a long time in the last process. We want to make sure that this is as short as possible and that, you know, our ambition would certainly be to, to get a mandate uh, for the, the Commission to negotiate before the end of our presidency. That's ambitious, of course it's ambitious, but I think it, it would recognise the importance of US-EU uh, trade as a, as a channel that can address our needs in, on both sides of, of the Atlantic to create new opportunities for growth. So our informal in, in, in April will seek to bring obviously all the member states together but also in, in co collaboration with uh, IBEC and, and the American Chamber to have, you know, to bring key players together to Ireland. So there can be a, a deeper understanding of what the potential uh, pitfalls are. There are of course sensitivities. This won't be plain sailing. But I think there is now a clear uh, wind behind the idea that this ambitious agreement is something that leadership on both sides of the Atlantic want. And you know, I think there's a far greater opportunity to deliver if you have that, if you like, top-down momentum instead of trying to build up such an agreement uh, from the bottom when you know, all of the criticisms and the reservations become dominant. Uh, I think this is a real opportunity and you know, we, we certainly want to, to, to do everything we can to, to support it. From a, from a domestic point of view, of course, these free, free trade agreements are immensely important. You know, the US is one of the most important, the most important trade uh, channel for Ireland. Uh, it's larger than any of the other, larger than the UK or, or any of the other channels in terms of overall trade. And it's one that clearly it's in Ireland's interest to, to, to have uh, you know, less regulatory barriers and, and, and open up uh, the real possibilities that are, are there. The second area is, is to address market barriers, and <clears throat> I'm old enough, unfortunately, to be, uh, have been um, involved back in the 80s with uh, the then um, commissioner, the UK commissioner, uh, who was uh, driving reform, um, what was it? Cofield, Lord Cofield, indeed. Uh, and I remember the frustrations and the difficulty of the harmonization and building the, building the single market brick by brick. And that has continued to be the challenge. Uh, but I think it's, it's important to, to understand the real opportunities. Uh, the full application of the services, free competition in services, is, represents an opportunity of 2.5% of EU GDP. The single market since 1992 has delivered 2.1% extra in GDP, 2.8 million extra jobs to, to, the, to the union. So this slow, painstaking work, which we will take on uh, under the Single Market uh, Act initiatives, Single Market Act 1 and Single Market Act 2, we are determined to deliver as much as we can. It, it's slow, it's painstaking work, but there are significant areas within our grasp. Professional qualifications, public procurement, posting of workers, e-signatures. They're all, if you like, dossiers that we believe are, are at a mature stage that we can hope to, to deliver in the course of our presidency. And I think you know, that continued determination to open up our markets, to get the benefits of the, of the specialization, the growth dynam dynamism that that can give, is something that we are determined to, to, to seek to, to deliver, and will be a, it is a key part of our, our presidency in delivering in the Single Market Act. The third area that you know, I think is really important is you know, seeking to take a lead in, in key uh, areas of technology. 
I think the figure is, is quoted, I can't remember the source, but I, 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 I think it's, a, it's an EU source reliable, that where EU spends about one third of the money on research in key enabling technologies, we generate only one sixth of the commercialization. And I think this clearly, you know, correcting that imbalance between what we put into research and what we get out at the other end in terms of commercialization, startup jobs, exports, is a, a, a real challenge for us. And I think it's vital that we, you know, get our act together in this area if we're to lift performance, EU performance, and indeed our, our own performance, which, which mirrors that. There will, in the course of our presidency, um, we hope to form and be involved in the formation of a grand coalition for the ICT sector. Uh, many of you will know that there is uh, an estimate now that there will be 700,000 jobs unfilled in 2015 in the whole ICT area. Uh, these are professional people who are bringing, if you like, the the, the, the capability of ICT to transform not just the ICT sector, but many other sectors. Uh, I, I read a book recently, uh, a guy called Moretti, uh, Enrico Moretti, uh, who's, who's writing in the States, one of the, the, the United States universities. And his estimate is that for every one such job in ICT, in that, you know, leading edge ICT, there are five jobs elsewhere in the economy generated by, by, by such you know, key enabling uh, talent. So when you think of 700,000 jobs left unfilled and the impact that that has if, with that sort of a knock-on, you can see that there is a gaping gulf that we need to, to, to address. And Ireland has, uh, you know, I think it's heartening to see Ireland is moving ahead of the posse in the sort of initiatives that, you know, we have taken, uh, both with, in collaboration with, with Rory Quinn, to double our, our uh, output of, of graduates in this area, to use conversion courses to bring people who are qualified in other areas into the ICT uh, field. But, you know, delivering in that area is a real opportunity. We hope also to, to sign the unified patent. This has been something that I think has hampered uh, it's made it more costly for people to, to uh, have uh, patents when you have to you know, sign them in different countries, in different languages and so on, and when you don't have a unified enforcement system. So this is a, a, a real opportunity. We also plan to debate uh, the whole issue of copyright modernization. I think this is a key area. Uh, it's a very controversial area, but I think people recognize that copyright law needs to catch up with the opportunities that are being created in, in uh, the digital economy. Uh, and, you know, we, we are handicapping the the creativity, if we don't find a new you know, modus of operandi between those who create, uh, who are creative and create content and those who, 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 who use it. Uh, and I think you know, that, that's really a, an area of challenge that will continue you know, for a long time. Research budgets are also very important, uh, and I think it's, it's significant that the MFF, while we don't have the detailed agreement yet, it's significant that the, the 125 million that was set aside for areas of growth, education, research, and innovation, that has increased by 27%, uh, 34 billion, compared to the, to the last framework. Uh, so there is a genuine focus on, on, on this area, and I think we need to make sure that you know, those research budgets uh, are more focused focused on delivery. And just as Ireland has in, in the last number of, of, you know, in the last 18 months, we've been focusing our research on, on areas of priority that can really deliver returns and trying to make our system more commercialization friendly. I think the same challenges uh, will face the EU in its investment and there's the same ambition to use this powerful research budget not only to create excellence in terms of knowledge but also to create the opportunities to, to, to commercialize it. And clearly, you know, areas like the digital market and exploiting that is, is key to, to, to opening up the, the, the opportunities that technology de deliver. Again, the estimates are that the digital market could add 4% to GDP if it was fully exploited. And we need to build the infrastructures, the policies, uh, and the legislative framework to allow that happen. 
I think Ireland, you know, is probably again, you know, relatively ahead in this field. But you know, at twenty three percent of our business is trading online, it still leaves whatever seventy seventy seven percent who don't. Uh, I think it is a, a a tool that can transform businesses. It has shown to double the rate of growth of, of businesses who do use you know active trading online. Similarly, active you know interaction with government through e mechanisms can greatly reduce. Uh, can gr greatly uh, reduce cost. We believe in Ireland that you know, technologies like big data and the analytics that underpin that are going to open up huge, uh, huge opportunities. They're transforming the sort of business models that will survive and grow in the future. And there's an immense agenda here that you know, the, the EU has to facilitate in its leg legislative framework, as well as the sort of commitments it makes in, in, its, research, uh, in its research commitments. And we, I'll be working, obviously, with Sean Sherlock, who's, who's, um, who chairs the Research Council, to make sure that, uh, you know, that we get the best out, out of that. It's encouraging already to see that you know, small and medium enterprise, is go its share of those research budgets is going to go up from 15% to 20 And that, that, that brings me to the final theme that I, I mentioned, and that's you know, releasing the creativity of enterprise. SMEs across the union employ about two-thirds of all, all people employed in Europe, and it's not any different here in, in Europe. Commonly, it's believed that, these, uh, that small and medium enterprise generates about 80% of job growth. It's predominantly the small and the startup and the growth companies that generate the employment growth, not the larger established ones. And it behoves us to look at the startup environment across Europe, at access to finance, which in many countries like our own, the uh, difficulties that the banks have faced have created huge problems in access to finance for small and medium enterprise. And you know, it's important that we deliver uh, the ambitions that have been set out in programs like the COSME program, uh, which you know, obviously under Commissioner Tajani, the new ambitions of the EI, EIB to put more capital into this area and to develop new instruments, the new microfinance programs that are going to be funded under the, 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 the MFF. Clearly, these are real opportunities, and we will be holding a forum on access to finance uh, across the union for SMEs with Commissioner Tejani to look at you know, how can we get better models. Some of those are obviously going to be traditional bank models, you know, evolving the sort of financial instruments to a more export-oriented uh, union, but some of them are going to be new financial models and you know, non-bank financing that we, ne we need to develop and have been traditionally behind the curve in venture capital and so on. The EU has been behind the curve. There, there are other changes that I believe will also be significantly important to, to small and medium enterprise that can, you know, by being dynamic at European level, we can make it easier to, to, to build and grow. For example, the modernization of the state aid uh, mechanisms with the state aid rules by bringing down, for example, a higher de minimis. So it, it's easier to support startups without a lot of um, you know, regulatory drag. Opening up public procurement to SMEs is another part of the single market that we hope to, to make real progress on. That represents almost 20% of EU GDP. You know, there are opportunities by bringing down barriers, making it easier to, to, to tender for SMEs to, to, to penetrate that. Clearly, there's a continuing agenda around regulation and regulatory burdens that the EU will be taking up in, in our presidency. And we hope to see the Commission publish what will be the successor to their last set of targets, which was to bring down administrative burdens by 25%. The, the, the next, the, the successor to that is eagerly awaited, where we expect, you know, 10 key areas that create the most difficulty for, for a business will be identified and, and we will seek, you know, the U union will seek to, to you know, address those areas. It's not just like, unlike what we are doing at home here with you know, our now focus on licensing in the retail trade, taking just one sector, to seek to rationalize the, the burden of compliance with licensing. We have far too many licenses and far too many portals through which people need to, to go to comply with our licensing requirements. Uh, and we need to, to reform those here at home just as, as the EU does. So I think, you know, to, to, to sum, summarize and conclude, the EU is in a, a difficult uh, crisis, but I think it's showing new sources of dynamism. We're not there yet, but I think, you know, between the, the, the areas that I've mentioned, trade, between uh, 
opening up the, 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 the markets that we already have, seizing real opportunities to take a lead in, in key technologies where Europe has the capacity to, to take a leadership role and needs to align itself better, releasing the creativity of small and medium enterprise that are the, the key drivers. I think there's a lot we can do uh, to drive a, a, a new growth-oriented Europe. Uh, and I think, you know, the, 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 the Taoiseach has from the very outset been determined that, you know, one of the, the characteristics of, of this government will be to bring that broader employment uh, objective to the very core of, of public policy. We've done that domestically with our action plan for jobs, which is a time-based, uh, closely monitored uh, instrument for keeping focus right across government on the central challenge of, of employment. I think it has been a very effective tool within uh, Ireland. And I think you know, the theme of our presidency is really to get that same sort of cross-governing government thinking about the core challenge which is uh, for, for Europe, which is the employment challenge, with you know, so many uh, young people, 26 million all people out of work, very high unemployment rates about, among uh, young people. You know, the, the, the importance of the growth and jobs theme is absolutely central to, to, uh, to Europe's future. And as you know, the President of the Commission said uh, when, he, when he visited Ireland recently, Europe's credibility is under scrutiny here. And you know, our capacity uh, as a union to deal with the broader challenges that our people are, 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 are facing is going to be central to you know, the political momentum behind the union that has been such an important and transforming uh, influence in, in, in European uh, politics, economics, and society over the last 50 decades, five decades. Um, so I, I look forward to taking whatever questions or comments you might have, uh, which I will deal with to the best of my ability. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.